So the last case in this symposium is focusing again on double refractory disease, but this time in an older patient population where some of the options that were considered earlier, for example, repeating a stem cell transplant, either an autologous or moving on to an allogeneic would not be an option. And the same thing would probably not be an option from the perspective of doing something like VDT PACE in this older patient population. So let's go to the case. This is an 82-year-old gentleman with IgG kappa myeloma, one of my patients at Anderson, originally diagnosed about six years ago now with ISS stage 2, hemoglobin of 8, and had a normal fish, although a constitutive inversion, received induction therapy with LEN and low-dose dex for four cycles, went on to stem cell transplant, got a VGPR, and then was put on maintenance lenalidomide, which led to a CR. Did quite well for a few years, but then unfortunately had evidence of progression. We tried to increase the dose of len and add a little bit of dexamethasone, but though that helped in transiently reducing the M protein, the patient not long thereafter did progress. And we switched to bortezomib and dexamethasone, which after a couple of cycles did result in a reduction that was quite nice, but unfortunately not particularly durable. And the patient progressed on cycle six of treatment with also symptomatic disease in that the creatinine was creeping up a little bit. And a creatinine of two in an 82-year-old is somewhat, of course, significant compared to a younger patient. So here are some of the options. What would you do in this patient? The patient now has disease that's been refractory both to LEN-based and bortezomib-based therapy and is 82 years old, still wants to get more treatment, slightly elevated creatinine. Would you use a bortezomib-based regimen, a LEN-based regimen, a carfilzomib-based regimen, a POM-based regimen, or some kind of targeted therapy on a clinical trial? Very good. So after the psychedelic music is over, let me just give you an overview of what the options are, although I'm going to try to go a little bit quickly because many of these have already been discussed. These are the current preferred regimens from the NCCN for relapsed and or refractory disease, and these are some of the other regimens. And of course, category one recommendations would be for bortezomib alone from Paul's study some years ago, although because this patient was just refractory to bortezomib, you would probably not want to go back just with bortezomib. You could certainly consider adding something like cyclophosphamide or thalidomide, though, and moving forward in that regard. Another option is bortezomib with liposomal doxorubicin, which has some advantages over bortezomib single agent in terms of PFS as well as OS, and then lenalidomide and dexamethasone, which was compared in a couple of phase three studies, including one led by my colleague Donna Weber, and we know that lendex is superior to dex. For this patient, again, probably less of an option because he had in the previous line of therapy just progressed on LEN and DEX-based treatment. Carfilzomib, you've seen the data a couple of times. The response rate for patients who were refractory or intolerant to bortezomib and lenalidomide was 20%, and for patients who were refractory to both, the response rate was 15%. So a positive number, but not one that we would not want to improve upon further, although long-term outcomes were fairly good here with a median overall survival of about 16 months compared to, as you heard, nine months as would be the expected benchmark. Now in this patient, this patient had some decreased renal function and with a serum creatinine of two, probably has a decreased creatinine clearance. And this graph here that I've tried to highlight shows you some of the benefits of carfilzomib in patients with various levels of renal insufficiency. The number of patients is still relatively small, but you can see a good response rate no matter what the creatinine clearance turned out to be. So certainly carfilzomib would be a good option. 
And here are data that were specifically culled from a study just looking at patients with renal failure. And again, even in patients with severe renal dysfunction, as well as the last group here, group five, who were on hemodialysis, the response rate may have been slightly even higher with carfilzomib in patients on dialysis, although caution, it's not a randomized study, and it's not controlled for number of prior lines of treatment. Other options for the future may be to use higher doses of carfilzomib. Here's a study from the folks at Sloan down the street that showed that carfilzomib at 56 milligram per meter squared, as opposed to 20 or 27, may have a better response rate. And I mentioned earlier the SWOG study where we have a randomized trial comparing 2027 to 2056, which will firmly, I hope, answer the question yay or nay. And then another option, which James Berenson presented at ASH, was thinking about weekly carfilzomib given just once instead of twice weekly carfilzomib. And with that approach, they were able to get up to higher levels with about 77 milligram per meter squared as the tolerated dose. And the overall response rate was about two thirds of patients with almost 90% having a minor response or better. Again, tough to compare because they're not randomized, but still there's at least some indication that higher doses may result in better outcomes. Combinations are always going to probably be superior, and Michael Wong at our institution led a study of carfilzomib with lenalidomide and dexamethasone, and the efficacy data there were quite good, although this was not a study that looked only at double refractory patients. And of course, later this year, we're hoping to hear the data from the Lendex versus Carfilzomib Lendex large randomized study that could lead to approval of Carfilzomib in the relapsed setting as opposed to just relapsed and refractory. The pomalidomide data sets you've seen a couple of times. The efficacy data are quite good. This is from Paul's study showing that even in patients with dual refractory disease, you get a very nice response rate and response durability with POM and DEX as well as with POM alone. And here are some of the data about durability. And we have randomized data from Thanos Demopoulos comparing POM and low-dose DEX with high-dose DEX, where overall survival, as you might imagine, is much better with POM and low-dose DEX. And the same is true in patients with dual refractory disease. You can see a very low p-value, meaning a very nice statistical significance. Other options, you've seen the CAR-POM-D combination a couple of times, and the response rate of 83% of patients with minor response or better. All of these patients were lenalidomide refractory, and almost all of them had been exposed to bortezomib as well, although not all were bortezomib refractory, but you've seen the median overall survival of a year and a half or more. And this is also very effective in high-risk patients. If you look at the overall survival on the right, although the numbers are small, you can see that even in patients with intermediate and high risk, the survival is the same as it is with standard risk. Paul's combination of pomalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone has had very nice responses, and you've seen the data before. Another drug that we haven't talked much about, but one that is still interesting, is a kinesin spindle protein inhibitor, a new mechanism of action for myeloma called ARRY520, now has a name called philanacib. This is a drug which interferes with normal cytokinesis, or I should say division of the cell, instead of the nice normal spindle on the left as cells are trying to separate their chromosomes, what this does is interfere with the motor that pulls on the microtubules attached to the duplicated chromosomes, and you get a disordered spindle on the right with resultant cell death. This has been looked at both as a single agent and in combination with dexamethasone, as well as in combination with bortezomib 
and carfilzomib, and studies are coming in combination with pomalidomide. If you look at the column on the right, you can see a 20% response rate. This was in patients who were triple refractory, meaning refractory to bortezomib, to lenalidomide, and to dexamethasone. So not a bad outcome there. And especially if you look at patients that have a low level of a serum marker called AAG, now you see the response rate going up to 30% or more. And I mention this in part because there is a large registration study coming to hopefully a center near you. And actually the first patient is already being screened for this trial, which if positive, could lead to the approval of this drug, which would give us another option for dual refractory patients. And also on this particular trial, patients have to have been exposed to either carfilzomib or pomalidomide. So it would be an even more heavily pretreated and difficult to get a response out of patient population. And these are the survival curves with both philanacib alone and philanacib with dexamethasone. You can see these were patients with a median of up to eight previous therapies really nothing available there. I mentioned that this has been looked at in combination with carfilzomib. We've been doing this at MD Anderson. The combinations and the schedules mesh together quite well. And although it's still early, 63% achieved a minor response or better. And a randomized study is about to start here as well of carfilzomib versus philanacib with carfilzomib. Other drugs to think about, there's the AKT inhibitor that Peter Voorhees presented at ASH, which showed good responses with bortezomib and DEX. And even in patients with bortezomib refractory disease, the response rate was quite nice. So we're all looking forward to future studies with that combination. And you've seen the daratumumab data a couple of times, as well as daratumumab with lenalidomide and dexamethasone and also the SAR data, the other anti-CD38 antibody. So I think the conclusions are that novel options, unfortunately, still are needed for older patients who are dual refractory and have renal insufficiency, but the current data support using carfilzomib, which seems to have comparable tolerability and efficacy versus patients with normal renal function, we don't yet have a lot of data about pomalidomide safety and efficacy in patients with decreased renal function, although Jayton Shaw at our center is leading and about to complete a study of POM in patients with various levels of renal function. So hopefully soon we'll have guidance for you about what to do with POM dosing in this setting. So I would say that probably my approach here would be to go forward with a carfilzomib-based combo, such as carfilzomib with dexamethasone, although if the patient were more robust, and once we have data about POM dosing in renal insufficiency, carpom-dex would be a very good option, as would bortezomib, POM, and dexamethasone.